When I'm doing this and I think there's cyanobacteria in the water, I wear gloves. Careful not to get any on me. I generally carry bleach in the in the boat so that I can wipe off any cuts I get with that and then put some neosporin on them. In the spring and summer of 2016, the Indian River Lagoon was devastated by toxic algae super blooms. The algae killed massive numbers of fish and wildlife and poisoned the air and water with a lethal bacteria called microcystis. It's a known neurotoxin, and it may have straight line links to delayed degenerative neurological diseases. My name is Marty Baum, and I'm the Indian River Keeper. It is my job to speak for this lagoon that cannot speak for itself. I'm its protector. Everglades of South Florida were once a river, allowing fresh water to flow continuously from Lake Okeechobee to the ocean. But over the last century, South Florida's wetlands had been filled in with development and farmland. To prevent flooding, Lake Okeechobee was dammed. Overflow from the lake is now diverted through canals and dumped into the fragile ecosystem of the Indian River Lagoon. This water is rich with fertilizers and pesticides, including nitrogen, phosphorus, and ammonia from citrus groves, cattle ranches, and sugarcane farms. Combined with runoff from thousands of home septic tanks and lawns, the Indian River Lagoon has become the perfect breeding ground for toxic cyanobacteria. Marty Baum is a sixth-generation Floridian and has been exploring the lagoon since he was a child. In his role as the river keeper, Marty is the bridge between local scientists and the community, using technology to monitor the health of this fragile ecosystem. This is the haulover, and this is where it gets really, really, really salty. All of this right here, right now, is having a brown algae bloom. The people who aren't involved at the same level as I am, they have lots of questions. There's misconceptions and such. It's all lawns, septic tank, and a really poorly performing sewer plant. I feel it's my job to help them learn that, satisfy their question with, with, with truth and with science. Any questions? From the time I could walk, uh, I've had my face in the water. When I was a younger man, the entire lagoon was more vital. It was full of life and energy, and there was more fish and more everything. The water was clean, there was seagrass everywhere. It was not unusual to see 20 acres of mullet lift all at once. It sounded like a thunderstorm as it went, with the fish jumping and the birds, and, and, and it's incredible, incredible. And over the years, that has diminished. The ecosystem is no longer balanced here. The whole thing is out of whack. It is our, our hope that with science, we can figure out how to return this natural balance within the ecosystem. If science can help us understand what exactly is causing these problems, then we can address them as a point source. This lagoon has the highest diversity, not only of fish, but of many other organisms, seagrasses, et cetera, of any other estuary within the United States. We used to come in and dive off this wall. There are lobsters, all kinds of things in there. There were a lot of reef fishes, but it's not there anymore. It's gone. The seagrass bed where I had the most species I've ever collected in a net was right there, and it's gone now. It's been dredged out. It's gone. People like Grant Gilmore, a fish scientist, he provides us with what's happening to them. It ties things together, cause and effect. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Orca and organizations like them have found ways to put together water monitor systems that talk to us 24 hours a day. We need to be using 21st century technology to address what are extremely complex issues. 
This is a Kilroy. It's a water quality monitoring system that we've assembled in order to be able to assess the health of the lagoon. And we have 27 of them up and down the lagoon in order to measure the nitrite, nitrate, and phosphate that are contributing to these blooms. It's pretty impressive in that it's kind of um, uh, a little mini laboratory in there. So it pulls up water samples at regular intervals. We can program how often it takes a sample every few hours usually. One of the breakthroughs that we've made recently thanks to the measurements that we've been doing, we've discovered that ammonia is maybe a pretty big deal in explaining why things have changed so radically in this lagoon recently. A lot of the fertilizer industry has shifted over to uh, urea, which um, breaks down to ammonia because it's cheaper. It allows us to know what's happening in the water all the time, 24 hours a day. And because it's archived, we can go back and compare what happened today with a month ago, two months ago, two years ago, and it, it'll show a trend. I'm actually a deep sea biologist who got kind of distressed about the fact that we're destroying the ocean before I'm even getting a chance to find out what's in it. And so that was what prompted me to um, help found the Ocean Research and Conservation Association. So these are muck samples from the bottom of the Indian River Lagoon. So we go out and we take these as indicators of a lot of where the pollution is accumulating. And we were really surprised how much of the muck was really toxic. What we're doing now is we're breaking our samples up. We're particularly interested in determining how much silt was in our sample. The very small particles have more surface area for toxins to bind to. So we want to know how much silt is in our sample because we found a correlation between particle size and toxicity. We found things like heavy metals, mercury, copper, actually quite a bit of copper because that gets used to fertilize citrus groves. As a scientist, all I can do is provide the information of where the problems are and try to do it in a most even-handed way as possible with no bias whatsoever, and then make that available to policymakers because it's only government that's ever going to be able to solve problems on this scale. So that means that the stakeholders have to be asking their politicians to do the right thing to clean up these problems. Marty's work is essential because he's the link that is reaching out to the public and trying to make them aware of these circumstances. And Marty's a big megaphone, and he really gets the word out, and he's not shy about it. In a poll across our state, the number one concern of Floridians was clean water. Yet every body of water that was tested in Florida is impaired. And the destruction of our estuaries and of the Everglades not only continues, but it accelerates. When I asked Robin her vision, she said she wanted butterflies and, and hummingbirds. She said, I really don't want a lawn. I would rather it all be a garden. The butterflies are here all day. The hummingbirds come all day. And you know, to have this, we didn't have to poison anything. I'm acutely aware that I'm going to be held accountable for how I lived and what I did by my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And when they start looking around and saying, where was grandpa when all of this was going on and it left me like this, I'm going to pass that test. When I die, I'll, I'll die knowing that I have done my part as best as I can to try to make a difference. There's a lot of things we'll never get back, but by golly, we don't have to destroy everything around us.